we'll pray for you. So uh, we may even pray for her now. So let's just do that. If you have your Bibles, first of all, let's open them up to uh, 2 Thessalonians. As we get look at chapter uh, 3, verses 6 through 18, we'll be finishing 2 Thessalonians today. And so let's just go ahead and pray for um, uh, Becky and then, and then ask God's blessing on our teaching today. Let's do that. Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. And what an honor and a privilege it is, Lord, to work alongside you in ministering to your flock. And uh, Lord, I just uh, thank you for the privilege you give us, for all those working in the kids' ministry, Lord, for those working in greeting and the ushers, and, and Lord, those that are just, again, doing different ministries around the church. I just thank you for what an honor it is to be able to serve alongside you. And I, I just pray, Lord, that each person that served this morning would be blessed and feel your favor uh, as they work alongside you. Lord, we do pray for the upcoming election. We ask that you would bring out your will for our nation, that you would have mercy on us. You would put those in office you want to be there. And God, for those who are now running for office or already in office who know you, like Senator Massey, and there's many others, encourage them, Lord. I, again, this is a hard job they have. It's a hard thing to step into in today's environment, uh, not just dealing, Lord, with man, but dealing with the spiritual realm. So I pray you encourage her, and I pray you encourage all those, Lord, who know you and love you and are trying to make a stand for you uh, in the halls of government, especially at a time like this. But Lord, now we shift our gear, uh, gears and look toward what you're going to show us this morning. God, I pray that as we open up the word now, you would just again open our hearts. Lord, that you would just speak to us, that you would feed us, you would teach us about personal responsibility. And we thank you, Lord. We ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Now, as we get into the passage today, we need to lay a little bit of groundwork before we jump into it. But personal responsibility is a very interesting topic. You know, again, we live in a society today that currently is not uh, living very responsible in many ways. And personal responsibility has very little significance in our society today in many ways. And what do I mean by that? Well, many like to blame everyone else for their problems. And then they expect everyone else to fix their problem. And lastly, they expect the world around them to pay for their problem. And then now we have a generation that wants everything for free. Has anybody seen that? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I'm very thankful to the parents I had for many things. You know, I, we can all look back and think of ways that we wish we did different as parents. But one of the things my parents did for me that I'm thankful for is, and again, we didn't have a lot of money growing up, so that's maybe part of the reason. But anything that we wanted as kids, we had to go out and get it. We had to make it happen. You know, I wanted to have a car, and so I had to go get a job to be able to buy a car. Um, I wanted to go to college, and so I had to work while I went to college to pay for college, and then also some grants. It wasn't totally me on that, so I will give you the wrong picture. But again, I had to basically put forth some effort if I was going to um, get the things that I wanted to get. And I'm, I'm very thankful for those lessons today because they carry on. They teach personal responsibility and how we need personal responsibility today. Um, our current generation, I think, has a very different mindset. And the mindset has become very normal almost to think that, you know what, not only do you not need to work for it, but everybody else should give it to you. But this is not only leads to a, an unproductive society, this is not in line with what God's word says. God lays out in his words, we're going to see today, a very clear guideline for what personal responsibility means inside of the church as well as out of the church. And we think about, you know, Paul and the Bible, and of course, this is spiritual matter that we're covering. And we think about the gospel as we get into the word of God. But Paul is also very practical in what he does. And um, God is very practical in how he writes through these different authors of the Bible, if you will. And God wanted us to know practical instruction. How do we live? How do we do it? And so as we get into today, we're going to see Paul again with that father's heart writing the church that he planted saying, look guys, um, this is the way you're to conduct yourselves. I see some things that are going wrong in the church. Deal with them. Teach personal responsibility. And Paul's going to show how he was personally responsible, but also um, how he's teaching them personal responsibility and, and what they're supposed to do. You know, I think about uh, the mom that's going away for a while, she writes all the notes. If she's leaving and the household is there, here's when this happens, here's when that happens, do this, do that, because she wants to make sure the household runs properly or whatever the case might be. Paul, again, being the father of this household, wanted to make sure that it ran properly. And so he's going to teach them responsibility. And the responsibility that we each have before God covers multiple areas it deals with social situations. It deals with financial situations as well. And that's what we're going to see Paul really deal with today. How do you deal with certain financial situations and financially a society, really even beyond that, how it should operate within the church and God's design without the church um, as we get into it? Because again, God wants us to be responsible. 
and not be irresponsible. I found a good article to give a good demonstration of irresponsibility uh, here recently. And listen about what this article says. Apparently, some of you that are artists or, or you're connected to art or you love art, you may have heard of this person. But somebody by the name of Banksy, I'm not an art guy, so I don't get all this, but some guy by the name of Banksy did a painting. Apparently, it's a very uh, a famous painting of a girl with a balloon. But listen to the headline. Banksy painting self-destructs immediately after being sold for $1.4 million. Listen to the article. This happened October 5th, 2018. Someone purchased the iconic Banksy painting for $1.4 million only to watch it immediately turn to shreds. Moments after the gavel came down on the sale of the, uh, the enigma enigmatic artist Girl with a Balloon painting at Sotheby's auction uh, house in London, the painting passed through a shedder that had apparently been hidden inside the frame. The painting only went partially through the shutter, leaving half of the painting intact and half of the painting shredded. The artwork, spray paint and acrylic on canvas, showed one of the artist's most well-known images, a young girl reaching her hand toward a red heart-shaped balloon. And, and here's a quote from Alex uh, 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 Bransick, Sotheby's senior director. He said, it appears we just got Banksy. Now, maybe he's kind of known for these kind of things. I don't know. But the bottom line is, if I just paid $1.4 million for a painting, I wouldn't want it to go through a shredder. How about you? I would call that the height of irresponsibility. Somebody came up to me after the service and said, Pastor Mark, I looked it up, and that doubled the value of the painting. I was like, only an artist could paint something, destroy it, and then double its value. I don't get it. I mean, look, take a tomato, throw it at a canvas. Look, sunset over, a, you know, Grand Canyon or something. They give it a name, right? And it's like, it's a tomato. It hit a wall. That's all it is. Look at those seeds. Just, just meditate for a moment. Anyway, as you can tell, I'm not an artsy guy. I don't mean to offend those of you that are. And if you have a painting with a tomato on your wall, God bless you. Uh, <laughs> boil some noodles and enjoy. That's a great. Anyway, that's just my kind of idea with that. But the bottom line is God wants us as believers to be responsible. And so Paul's going to deal with our personal responsibility. And by the way, there's a biblical principle here about responsibility that's built into this as well. Not just for the church, but it's a biblical model for society as a whole because God knows what works. The problem is since society is in general doesn't know God, they don't use it. And we see a lot of the problems that we see today. Now, what is the setting here? If you remember last week, Paul had just talked about praying that their word would run swiftly, that as they taught the word of God, it would go swiftly, that it would be received, and even as, uh, among the world, the same way it was among them, that God would protect them from unreasonable and wicked people. And uh, now he goes into these final instructions, again, like a father writing a letter. Okay, guys, I want to give you the final plans. Or here's what you need to do to get things straightened in your household, within the church, if you will. And notice he says there in verse 6, But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, and not according to the tradition which he received from us. Now, a number of things to note out here. Paul starts out this whole section and sets the tone by giving an authoritative command that is not only demonstrated in the word used here in the language, but then backed up by the highest authority possible, and that is the name of Jesus Christ himself. Paul's saying, this came from the Lord. This isn't just me saying this. Jesus gave this. The word used is in conjunction with that authority, and it gives a spiritual weight and speaks of the authoritativeness of the command. In other words, Paul is saying, this is a big command. They're all good big commands, but this is one that has the authority of Jesus Christ. I'm not just speaking this. You need to implement it as the pastoral staff, which they really didn't have yet, but they had leaders. It would appear at that point. But as a body, you need to implement this and so that God can correct the situation that's going on there in Corinth, which I'm Corinth, in, in Thessalonica. Uh, they also had issues in Corinth, so I'm thinking of them. We'll, but we'll get to the, the issues they were dealing with in just a moment. But notice the first command that he gives them in dealing with it. He says that they withdraw from any brother or sister in the Lord that is walking disorderly. Now, again, this is not referring to the unbeliever who does not know better because they don't know better. But this is referring to the believer. As a matter of fact, if we don't walk among the disorderly, we're never going to reach them, are we? We have to go among the unbeliever, and we can't expect the same thing from the unbeliever that we expect from those that are in Christ. But at the same time, we as the body of Christ more than ever should be walking in the obedience to the Word of God. And disorderly, again, here's some definition of the meaning, not only means disorderly, but also it means undisciplined, evading obligations, and being irresponsible. 
quite the definition. So he's saying any brother or sister that is evading their responsibilities and living irresponsible, we are to withdraw from them. Now, what does it mean to withdraw from them? The word here is not a heavy word that means disfellowship. This is not a church discipline issue where you see a brother not carrying their own weight, not being responsible within the body of Christ or in society and say, you can't come to church anymore. It's not that kind of thing. There are some sins that if they're not dealt with and they're not repented of, God commands the leadership to put that person out of the fellowship. That is few and far between and that is rare. But God does have that in his word. This is a word that specifically means avoid them. Avoid them. Don't pretend they don't exist. You know, don't act like that kind of childish or something. He just says, just withdraw from them so they have time to think about what they're doing and they're going to be, begin to question themselves and say, why in the world is everybody withdrawing from me? Why am I being treated this way? He's saying, don't treat them as though everything is normal and there's no consequence to what they're doing. Otherwise, they won't get it and they won't repent and they won't learn the lesson. You know, some of us learn a lesson simply by hearing it. Others, we have to experience it to learn it. Sadly, I was one of those who had to experience it to learn it. I'm thankful for those of you that can just hear it and learn it. Praise the Lord for that, but that wasn't me. And so there's the same kind of person in the body of Christ as well. And so he says, you know what? They know better than what they're doing, but now we draw from them. Quit hanging out with them. And if they ask, tell them why. He'll get into more detail later as to how they're to deal with them. And, and again, we're not to run from them. We talk to them about the issue, but we don't treat them as things being normal is the idea behind this. The point Paul is making is here they, is that they need to know their behavior is causing separation from us and the Lord in normal fellowship because of their actions. And again, like all church discipline, be it firm or be it gentle, the ultimate goal is repentance and restoration. That's the goal. Get them back right with each other. Get them back right with God. It's just a softer way in this particular example, a word that Paul uses here. Now, again, we talked about the official definition of disorderly, but what does it mean to walk disorderly? The scripture reveals many ways a believer can walk disorderly, but what Paul is addressing is today, and I'm just going to say it candidly because it seems like maybe a little bit of a heavy word, but Paul is addressing laziness and those that are not carrying their own weight. He says, you can't be letting that happen within the body of Christ. There were those in the fellowship at Thessalonica, according to Acts and the scriptures here and other places, uh, that let us know there were those who were simply living off of everyone else's generosity by asking them for money and help, but they were refusing to work themselves. Now, some say, well, it's because they believe the Lord was going to come back at any moment. And they said, you know what? I'm not going to get a job right now because I don't have one. And I want to be about the Lord's business when he comes back again. The Bible says this, we're to be about the Lord's business until he returns. Occupy until I come is the way the Lord said it. And I would much rather be serving the Lord, going forward in the Lord and get yanked out of here than be sitting around and the Lord suddenly show up and him say, why weren't you doing anything? Why were you just sitting around, so to speak? And so he says, you need to be responsible here. Don't use excuses and hold each other accountable. But regardless of the reason, God requires that each one of us carry our own weight when we can. Now notice I said that. We'll come to this again with another word meaning uh, later on in this, uh, at the, toward the end of the chapter here. But it, it, it's, what he's saying is, and what I'm saying is, not everyone, there are some people that legitimately can't work. So if you can't work, if there's some legitimate disability, that's understandable. It's not a lack of compassion. It's not a lack of love. It's not a lack of caring. Paul is simply saying, but for those who can, it is required. Again, Notice also, Paul says it must be in line with the traditions that they had given them. Now, again, this is, note this, because some of you come from a background of churches or maybe a church denomination that had a lot of church traditions that weren't really biblical traditions. And this could be a stumbling block for you. And what do I mean by that? I had somebody even after first service come up and say, I really struggle with that verse there where it said to be in line with the church traditions because I came out of a church where there were church traditions that weren't really godly and they actually held the church traditions over the word of God. And I said, look, Paul qualifies this. Notice what Paul says. Paul didn't say follow just any church tradition. Paul didn't say just do whatever your church says. Here's what he said. Look at it again. He says, withdraw from every brother who does not walk orderly, not according to the tradition which he received where? From us. Paul was writing the scripture. Paul met Jesus Christ supernaturally. He'd met him in visions. Jesus was letting him know what he wanted for his church. Paul's saying this, basically we would say today, receive the traditions and walk in them that are in the word of God that you find in the Bible. 
The other traditions, I mean, there's some church traditions that aren't bad. Like maybe every year uh, they like to, I don't know, put, you know, garland around something at Christmas time. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about church traditions where it's something that's supposed to be biblical and spiritual, but can't be found in the Bible. He's not saying follow that. He's saying, follow the things that you received from us, not our opinions, but traditions or practices that are found within the word of God. He says, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but we worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Now notice here in verse eight, he says, we not only taught you what you were supposed to do, but we set the example so you could see it and follow our lives. And by the way, who in here doesn't know that the strongest example you can give is the one you live. You know, I was speaking with someone just yesterday saying, yeah, I know this preacher's kid or whatever. And he's walked away from, as he walked away from the church and walked away from God, he mocks God and he mocks other believers when they make any comment about something being moral or right. You know why? Because if your dad is a pastor and you see that your dad is living differently at home the way he is living in front of the church, then all you see is hypocrisy and you're going to turn away from that as a kid. I'm not making excuse for the kids. I'm saying moms and dads. Again, the reputation PKs have, a lot of it is true because of this very reason. But the bottom line is, you better be setting the example at home because the way you live is the way they're going to live. I remember hearing one guy say, you know, I tried my best to teach my kids table manners, but they kept eating like me. <laughs> because that's what they saw. And what they see is what they're going to do. And how you live is going to set the pace for your kids the rest of their life. Now, the moms and dads that are going, oh my goodness, it's too late. My kids are out of the home and they're not walking with God. I feel so convicted right now. Listen, is God not a God of restoration? Is God not a God of miracles? Did God not know that you would have those problems that were growing and now God has changed your life and all of a sudden he realizes and you realize, God, now pray for them. Ask for God to touch them because God will bring them back. I'm, I'm an example of that. I'm one of those that didn't really see the example growing up and God rescued me out of the midst of everything. So God can do that and God will do that if you pray for them. But again, set the example. And by the way, don't be afraid if you mess up, mom and dad, okay? You're going to mess up. Your kids are going to see that. But ask their forgiveness. They know you're human. Don't act superhuman. Be a human and be real with them. His point is we're not to be disorderly. Uh, we weren't rather disorderly when we were among you. And, and we worked and carried our own weight. And we set that example for you. And when we did eat your food, we paid for it so we wouldn't be a burden. And we see this in other places. Everywhere Paul traveled, he had the same conduct. Now, let me say this. It doesn't mean that you can't go out to eat and somebody can't pay for your meal. And you're doing wrong by paying for their meal. That's fine. He's not talking about temporary room and board for somebody that, you know, they need a place to stay or whatever the case might be. What he's saying is, if you're going to go long term, if this thing's going to last a lifetime, whatever, you need to start carrying your own weight and being responsible for yourself because you're setting a bad example. I love it. As a pastor, you know, people ask me to go to lunch quite often. And I think it's kind of, of course, if somebody asks you to lunch or if I ask you to lunch, then I would expect to pay for that lunch. And I understand the culture and I understand that, you know, they expect to pay for that lunch. But it's fun sometimes, you know, somebody takes you to lunch and you just kind of grab the ticket and pay for it. And they, whoa, whoa no, you can't pay for that. You're the pastor. Oh, well, really? <laughs> Pastors can't pay their own way? Ooh, oh, my goodness. I need to sit this right next to my reserved parking place at the front door. <laughs> Listen, guys, as pastors, we need to be setting the example of serving. We need to be giving. Uh, you know, in Paul's day, here's what was happening. Understand this. And really, in what was happening in Paul's day is the same thing happening in our day as well. And that is that there were a lot of people traveling around that didn't really want the heart of the people or, or, or sharing the Lord. They just wanted their money. And so they would go and just ask for money all the time. Give, 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 give. I want your money. I want your money. And they were asking for money so much, Paul said, I will never ask for anybody's money because that's not the heart. I didn't come to take your money. I came to give you Jesus Christ. And not only that, I set an example that I worked for my own bills while I was there. What a great example that is. It doesn't mean that it's wrong for a pastor to receive a salary or someone that's traveling around in ministry to, you know, to be able to, to receive if God gives to them. What it means is, is we need to be setting the example of that's not the point of all this. The point of this is we're to be giving. I've, I've shared with you guys before, I've had people in the past call up and say, we want to come and bless your church. I'm like, great. You know, we're going to come and do this and that and be, be, a, be, a, be a big blessing. Great. Come be a big blessing. I'm excited. And they say, and this is all it will cost. I'm like, you're, you're gonna, you want to come be a big blessing, but here's the bill. Now, if I ask somebody to come here and speak or ask a, a worship team or somebody to come in, we do give them an honorary and we try to, we bless them. 
That's my heart. I want to do that. I've asked them to come. I want to bless them on the way. I want to, you know, put money back into their ministry so they can do more. But there are people that just travel around to take advantage of the flock. And there are people that just speak to take advantage of the flock. Many of them are on TV. Again, use wisdom. Use wisdom. Is it wrong to take up an offering? Of course not. It's biblical. What did Moses do? God told Moses, take an offering from the people and use that money to build the tabernacle. There's nothing wrong in that. That's a biblical practice. But it's also not wrong to not take an offering. And that's what we do here at Calvary. We don't take an offering. You know why? Because when I was growing up, here's what I used to hear. Again, I was a preacher's kid. All you people want is our, our money. I didn't care when I didn't know the Lord. Well, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Suddenly I got saved. And I said, there's one thing I never want to hear at Calvary Chapel, Knoxville, that we want your money. So we're never going to take an offering. And now over 23 years of being here, we've never done it. And we're not going to start now. That doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that me growing up in a pastor's family, hearing that comment, being sensitive to it, I made up my mind right off the bat when I got saved, we're not doing that. So we'll put some boxes back here by the doors, you guys, because that's between you and God. We'll, leave, we'll trust in the body of Christ to do what's right. They know the word of God. They know what they're supposed to do. And we'll let God work out the details. And God has been more than faithful throughout the entire ministry. So neither one is right, neither one is wrong. But I think in ministry, we need to be able to adapt to our current societal situation and decide how we're gonna do things. And that might mean as church leadership or the way that a church functions, it may be out of the normal tradition of way churches function so that we can meet people with the traditions of the word of God. And so this is what Paul is saying. It all boils down to personal responsibility. Notice he said, we labor day and night. Again, the supply, to supply their own need. It's interesting, the words labor and toil come with the same basic meaning. And that is, it means, and I quote, the most strenuous and intense form of physical exertion. Paul was working hard. Listen, here's how the days were back then in the Thessalonica region. Your work day started very early in the morning and it went very late into the night. But the Thessalonians built into the middle of it a couple of hours of rest. So they'd get up early, work for a long time, take a couple hours rest, and then work late until the night. So Paul said, wait a minute, I want to take advantage of this free time. I can teach the word of God to the church and I can preach the gospel in the street or anywhere else that God sends me during this time. So Paul, with everyone else, started early in the morning making tents and doing what he did to pay all of his own bills. And then when the two-hour break came for everyone else, guess who didn't take a break? Paul didn't. He said, I'm going to take this opportunity to preach the gospel. And Paul taught the word and ministered to the people. And then Paul went right back to work with everyone else after that making tents. So he was able to work and do the gospel and do the work of the ministry at the same time, which again, sometimes is necessary in ministry, depending on what, where the church is and those kind of things. But he never got a break. And they didn't get a break. They were working with Paul. So he says, we work day and night, literally. Uh, you know, and he says it night and day because the Jewish day starts in the evening, goes that way. But our way of saying it. He kept it working through. And he said, we did this as an example for you so you could see where our heart was and, and what we wanted to do and how being diligent with your, your efforts and being prudent with your time and being wise. It doesn't mean it's wrong to take a break. It doesn't mean that at all. And it doesn't mean you don't have to always work so hard you can't move. Paul's just saying, listen, this is the example that we need to set as believers that we're going to be industrious, that we're going to work. And he says, we set that for you guys. Again, notice we work labor night, we labor day and night, so we wouldn't be a burden to any of you, he says. Look at verse 9. Not because we do not have authority. In other words, we had a right to. We, I was an apostle. We were traveling doing the work of the Lord. But to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. Listen, the Bible says that those that work in the ministry, the workman's worthy of his wages. There's nothing wrong in that. There's nothing wrong, as I said, somebody works in ministry getting a salary, getting paid for what they do because you've got to pay your bills. But the reality is Paul is saying, look, even though we have the authority to take money from you, others, we have what we need right now. We're going to work instead and we're going to give to you. We're going to set that example. And so we're going to lay our rights down. You know, sometimes as a believer, we do have rights, but we lay our rights down because Jesus laid his rights down. And we have to adapt to whatever situation needs to be adapted to in our day and in our culture and in the ministry of the person we're reaching out to. Again, as a Christian, it's not about having our rights. It's about doing what is right. And in this situation with so many taking advantage of the body of Christ in Paul's day and in our day as well, sometimes you need to make some changes so that people know, look, I'm here for you. I'm here to give. The ultimate giver is God. Look what God did. He gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. You couldn't give any more than that. 
and he still gives today on a regular basis. And by the way, with all the giving that he gives, how often do we thank him? And how often does the world thank him? Certainly we thank him more because we're aware of it. You think the world thanks him? Lord, thank you today that I can breathe. How many people do you think even as believers would say that? And I'm not laying a trip on us. I, don't, I didn't say that this morning either. But you know why we can breathe this morning? Because he's making our lungs move. Daniel, when he was speaking to Belteshazzar, remember the, great, the grandson, rather, of, of Nebuchadnezzar, when they were about to fall with the Babylonian kingdom, the writing on the wall, the handwriting on the wall, he said, somebody interpret this. They bring Daniel can do this, and Daniel comes in there. And I mean, really, Daniel was, was with this guy. They fell that night. He, this was the guy that took the implements of God, the holy things of God, and was sitting there using them to party with. And Daniel laid it on thick. I mean, if, I guess if you translate it today, it might be something to start out like this. Daniel, what does this mean? Well, let me tell you something first, you young punk. <laughs> Because that's really the attitude that he had. He said, the very breath you have, the God that you're mocking gave you. You know people that mock God today? You know who gives them the ability to mock him? God does. The mouth that curses God, the mouth that talks about how stupid the Bible is, how dumb Christians are, God gave them that mouth. God gives them every breath to blaspheme him and the church, and he still keeps giving them more. You know why? Because he loves them. And he hopes that one day they'll come to their senses and say, what am I doing? The one that created me, I'm sitting here attacking him. Well, what am I doing? I mean, how foolish can I be? And so this is what Paul is getting across to them. He's saying, look, I want you guys to know that it's about the God who created us. It's about what the Lord has done for us. You know, it's not about what we can get or the way we should, you know, uh, be trying to take from you. We're here to give, even like the Lord gave. And notice he goes on here, verse 10, he says, for, now it really gets deeper into it. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this. He says, remember when I was there, I already told you, here it is again. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. How do you think that would go over in today's society? This is God's standard for mankind. But Mark, that sounds so hard. That sounds so unloving, incompassionate. What about the poor? Listen, even the poor can work. And God gave a way for the poor to work in his day. Listen, God's, God's welfare system, if you want to call it that, was much better than ours. It wasn't just a check you received in the mail. He told all the farmers, because everybody worked their land, they were farmers. He said, don't get all of your grain. He said, in the corners, leave part of it. Leave all the corners of every field. When you take your fruit off the trees, leave part of the fruit on there. When you take the grapes, leave part of the grapes. And then he said to everybody that didn't have enough money to live, he said, go get them. And they would go to the field and cut down the grain and pull the weeds and pull it. What were they doing? They were working and they were getting their needs met. It did two things. It supplied for their needs and it gave them a sense of, you know what? I'm not just failing here. I'm, I'm actually get, I'm doing something to earn this. It gave a sense of that, that self-satisfaction that I'm doing the right thing. See, God knows, God made us, God created us. A lot of the depressions, a lot of things that happen is because we're not following God's design. And so Paul here says, make sure, especially within the church you're doing this, because he had heard that some were not doing that. He said, the bottom line is, is this is the biblical standard that God requires of mankind and especially the church because again, God created us. He knows what makes us tick and what makes us function and what makes us healthy psychologically and in every other way. And again, notice Paul isn't saying if someone couldn't work, they shouldn't eat. He said this, if anyone will not work, this is a choice. It's a decision. I'm not going to do it. I refuse to do it and I won't do it. He's saying that kind of person, he says, let them go hungry. Again, sounds a little cold, doesn't it? But you know what going hungry does? It causes you to think about a way you can get some food. And that oftentimes leads to going to do a little something to earn some money so you can go buy some food. And so it's a good, healthy thing for people in general and a good, healthy thing for the body of Christ. And so he says, regardless of how it sounds today, God knows what we need. And he knows that if he didn't require mankind to work and be responsible, then mankind wouldn't be, which leads to an irresponsible and unproductive life. God is an industrious and productive God. Yeah, but God took a day of rest. That's right. And you should have rest. He also worked six days and took a day of rest. Now, again, I know we do a five-day work week and two days off, but if you're like me, you have the, if you have two days off, it's really you only have one day off, and that's probably today or whatever, because on Saturdays, you're really getting all your other work done at home. So you're still working. It's just a different, you know, maybe not getting paid for it. That's kind of the thing. But uh, again, making the wife happy and also yourself as well and getting the jobs done. But God is an industrious and productive God. And since he created us in his image, he expects no less. Even before the fall of Adam, was, uh, God required work. You know what that? Someone say, no, work came after the fall. Now you have to, no, no. God said he created Adam. He said, now tend the garden. That's work. The thing is, it was just pretty sweet. 
You know? Hey, look at that. Let's take a break. Another photo. Oh, hold on. Let's see another break. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know. I'm sure he did more than that. But he says, now that you've fallen, he says, you're going to work by the sweat of your brow. Everything's going to be harder now. You're going to have to put more effort in. So when that work wasn't already instituted by God for mankind, it's that it became harder after mankind fell. And so this whole teaching of being responsible and working for what you eat, it's interesting. It brings up a very interesting side note as far as a case study goes in a lot of our founding fathers, which I find interesting because doing studying in our founding fathers, they based our nation on the Bible the best they could. You read about it. They use the Bible, and there's all kinds of examples I can give you. We can do that a different Sunday. But our founding fathers, again, with regardless of faults or non-faults or arguments about things we've messed up as a nation, we were founded on biblical principles. And this is the governing system that they built in. This is exactly how America functions. If you don't work, you don't eat. If you want to eat, you've got to go get a job. It's God's design, and that's why you've seen America be so successful economically, because so few nations follow God's guideline. Now, the shocking thing to me and the scary thing to me is, again, we talk about a new generation coming in, and now the new generation is saying, you know what, maybe not. Maybe we just kind of put everything together and distribute it and whatever. The reason that always fails Listen, the early church did that. Go back and read Acts chapter 5. The early church put everything together. It shows a good heart. I mean, hey, let's just take everything in and we'll just help everybody. The heart's great. The problem is some work, some don't. And as soon as the money runs out, and it will because you don't have as much going in as it's coming out, then everybody goes broke. And then when that happened, what did Paul have to do? He traveled around to all the other churches saying, hey, the church is broke in Jerusalem. Could you guys give a donation? I've got to take a donation back to them. They're all suffering there. Why? Because they tried this experiment that didn't really work. And let me say this. If the most righteous people on the planet can't make that system work, I can tell you the world never will. God says the way a society is to run, the way mankind is to run, is you don't work, you don't eat. Because hunger drives a person to be productive. He says in verse 11, For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but they're busybodies. <laughs> Again, now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. And notice he says, some were not working at all because instead they were using their spare time to be busybodies. And again, when you have spare time, that's oftentimes what happens. Rather than taking care of your own business, you start getting involved in everyone else's, right? And the word busybody here, it's interesting, the definition, it means meddling in other people's affairs. And that is while they were neglecting their own personal business and working, they were very involved with everyone else's, which led to gossip and caused trouble in the church. And again, there have been people like that off and on over the years that have visited Calvary Knoxville, and it does cause trouble, not just for them and those they're gossiping about, but the whole church. So, I mean, God knows what he's talking about when he sets these guys lines up. And here's what he says to fix it. He says they need to get a job, they need to be quiet about other people's business, and they need to eat what they earn and not what other people earn. Wow, strong message from the Word of God, is it not? How we need to hear this as a nation. And more than that, how we need to yield to this. Again, this goes back to why our nation has been so successful. I fear that's coming to an end. I think we're going to go the way of the world rather than the way of Scripture. And if so, it's going to disappear. But God knows what He's talking about. And the church definitely has to function that way. And by the way, even if the world goes the other way, if the church functions in that proper biblical model that God gives, then the church is going to thrive. And so it's a blessing. Now he says in verse 13, but as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Remember, he's given this list of all their final things they need to do before he says goodbye. Don't grow weary in doing good. I, you know, at first you read this and it sounds pretty obvious. But after doing ministry for many years, again, this is something I need to hear. It's something we all need to hear. Sometimes you get tired of doing good, even when you know it's the right thing. To do well, to do good means to do well, to act uprightly, and to do what is right. And I think the reason it's easy sometimes to grow tired and doing good or fatigued is we don't see the results we want as fast as we want, and we start losing heart. I am in the generation of fax it to me, and now you don't even need that. I'm just saying, I'm showing even that. Isn't that funny that we're dating ourselves by saying fax it to me? Now just boom, hit your phone, hit a button, whatever's there. I, the generation of drive up windows. I want everything now. Listen, I told you guys I planted grass recently. I'm the type that'll go put the grass on the ground and go out the next day and say, well, <laughs> you've been there all night. <laughs> what have you been doing, young man? Right? And I realized it's like, leave me alone. Give me time, man. You just put me here. You know, this whole conversation goes on and the neighbors are going, I mean, anyway, <laughs> that's how my mind thinks. And yet here's the reality. That seed is not going to take root and do anything unless it has the right conditions and time. It's like this seed planted today. Seed's getting planted in your heart. 
See, America got away from teaching the Word of God like we should have. And now look at the mess we're getting into. In our early days, the Word of God was taught by many pastors around the nation, line by line, verse by verse, from Genesis to Revelation. Paul said this, I have not shunned to declare to you the entire counsel of God's Word, not just certain topics, but all of it, because we need all of it to grow in all ways. And so we used to do that. I was reading just this past week, and I think I shared it on my radio show. I don't think I shared it with you guys last week. Something like 44% of those who call themselves evangelical Christians not only don't believe the Bible literally, but they doubt some of the main moral teachings of the Bible. There was a high number that actually said they believe that Jesus sinned. God sinned? You know what showed me? Mark, you pastors are failing. You're failing. Get in gear. Teach the Word of God. Line by line verse by verse, through the entire Bible, and don't be shy about it. Stand on it, whether the society accepts you or rejects you, because the only hope for America is Jesus Christ. It's the only hope for America. I'm telling you, you guys know that. That's why, that's why you're clapping. Listen, an election is not going to save America. A, a, a Republicans, Democrats, neither party, neither person, nobody's going to save America. Jesus is the only answer we have. And we've got to get back to the Word of God or it's not going to happen. And so the problem is I think we grow weary in doing good again because we don't see the results that we need, but don't grow weary. Mom, you've been pouring into those kids and they still keep on, you know, whatever. Keep, keep pouring into them. Keep discipline. Don't give up. They'll grow out of that. Something's going to happen. You've been praying. Nothing's happened. Continue to pray. I remember reading about a man that prayed something like, I don't know, 60 years for his friends. And then right before, and then he died. None of them gave their life to the Lord. And then right before they died, they gave their life to Christ. He never got to see the fruit. He didn't see any apple hanging on the tree. Not one blade of grass came up because the ground was too hard, but he didn't give up till the day he died. And God said, there'll be fruit. It just may not be in your way, in your time. Continue on to be faithful. Don't lose heart, moms and dads. Those in ministry, don't lose heart. Don't stop praying. Keep on going because it has to happen. You've got to break up the fallow ground. And sometimes it takes a lot of rain and that rain comes through prayer from heaven. And so prayer to heaven and God's spirit coming down from heaven. He says, begin, don't grow weary. 14, look at this. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, he now goes back to that same theme at the beginning. He says, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Again, we go right back to the same meaning of the word. I'll only give it a further picture before we explain it. Look at verse 15. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Okay, same idea, same word at the beginning. He gets back to that theme he did about distancing yourself from a brother, a brother or sister, but it doesn't mean to put them out of the church. It means avoid them that they may feel shame and repent. But notice he says this, I love this balance. Don't treat them as an enemy. They're not your enemy, they're your brother, they're your sister. He says, admonish them. And what that means is you need to talk to them. Who do I want to talk to them? You need to talk to them. Listen, the way you're living is not right. It's not about judging someone. It's about sharing your heart with the Word of God and saying, I, I love you. I care about you. I want to see you get back on the right path. What are you doing? You know what the Bible says. You don't want to hear it. You don't have to hear it. But here's what I'm, I'm going to come to you with enough love to do that. And if you don't, I can't hang out with you anymore. You're going to be doing that? You want to go hang out in the, in the bars and start drinking? I'm sorry. I can't go with you. I'm not going to do that. And in this case, it was just somebody again taking advantage of the church and wanting them to give them everything. And he says, you know what? Just let them, let them feel the shame of you pulling away. It's interesting because the word ashamed here, it has a very interesting meaning in the language. It means, note this, and I quote, a wholesome shame that causes one to look at their inner person. Did you know there's a such thing as a wholesome shame? That's what this means. It's a wholesome shame, but the result is not just to shame them and embarrass them. And so they sit back and go, you're kidding. You're not going to hang out with me because I, I won't get a job. What's wrong with you? You know, come on, man. I'm not talking about somebody trying to get a job. I'm not talking about somebody. That, we know all that. I'm talking about somebody says, I'm just not going to work. Forget it. And again, some people don't have to work and that's a blessing of the Lord. That's a whole different matter. But for those who need to, and there's bills to pay, he says, you need to encourage them. You need to be working. And so wholesome shame here. Why is it wholesome? Because they've done right. It leads to repentance and restoration, which is the goal. And now Paul finishes up with his benediction here. He says, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, with a sign, which is a sign in every epistle. So I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So again, he always ends by saying, the grace of the Lord be with you. Amen. And we make several points here that I want to point out before we end, end this. And notice Paul ends his letter not only with this blessing of peace, 
But he calls Jesus the Lord, which means master, the master of peace. Why do I find that? Because Jesus is our masterpiece. Not like this guy that ground it up and put it through the grinder or whatever. Jesus is the master of peace. And if you need peace this morning, and who doesn't? If you call out to the master of peace, that means he controls it. He's Lord of the peace, right? Talk about the movie Lord of the Rings or whatever, Lord of the Ring type thing. He's, he's the Lord of peace. You go to him, he's going to give you that peace. You cry, Lord, I need peace this morning. The Bible says you're the Lord of it. You're the master. Would you please give me peace? I don't have any peace. He says, yes, I control the peace in the universe. I'll give you peace. But your job is to get your eyes on me. He said, those who fix their eyes on me, they will have God's perfect peace. And so I love that he's the master. I love he points that out. He's the master. I know you can grab that for yourself today, but also makes a very important point here as he finishes, because remember, false letters have been circulating in his name. Paul would oftentimes dictate his letters, have somebody else write them. And Paul says, okay, I had someone dictate this letter. I had someone else write it, but so that you know that I really wrote it, they were dictating for me. He said, the bottom line is, he said, I'm going to put my own signature on it. And Paul says in another place, he didn't say it here, but another book, he says, see with what large letters I write. And a lot of people think that Paul had some eye problems. And so you'd look at the letter and go to the back. Is that really from Paul? Turn, oh, oh, oh. yeah, look at that. That's definitely from Paul. We're talking elementary lines and all. This is great, you know, right? But he did that. He said, I don't want anybody to trick you. He said, when I write you something, I want to know that you can trust it. And it's something that's written in your life and on your heart. And see, that's what Jesus is doing for you this morning. For some of you, he's written something very sweet on your heart. As you've heard the word of God, he's writing on your heart. And he's written a message to you. There may be something like, yeah, forget what Mark said there, but this right here is from me. And I'm writing that on your heart. Listen, if God has written on your heart this morning, respond to it. He's written you a love letter on your heart. I love you. Why are you living this way? What are you doing? Do you even know the Lord? Is God writing on your heart this morning? And for the first time, God is drawing you in saying, I've written to you on, on your heart that I'm real, that I love you, that all you have to do is confess your sins and turn from your sin and follow me and I will give you eternal life. And I'll give you a place at my table and a place in my kingdom because I love you. He's writing a personal love letter on your heart and he's putting his signature on it. You can't mistake it. If the enemy says something to you, it won't be in love. If somebody says something to you this morning by the spirit and it's in love, that's the Lord. Receive it, receive it and respond to it. I want to give you a chance to do that. I want to pray for us as we finish that God would help us to, again, let the seeds that have been planted here take root in our lives, but also for those in here who, who may not yet know the Lord, that God would draw you in because this morning he showed you that he's real and that he loves you and you belong in his kingdom. Let's pray. Lord, thank you, God, for the sweet direction you give us in your word, the sweet instruction, God. Again, we look at even the way the world sees things, and it's quite shocking oftentimes compared to the world. But God, we're not a part of the world. We're a part of your kingdom. And we thank you for giving us instruction or leaving the note behind so that while you're gone on the temporary vacation to heaven, until we join you again, you've written down instructions on the countertop of our life saying, here's how you do it. Be faithful. Be diligent. Set an example. But Lord, I pray if there's any here this morning that for the first time, for the first time their eyes have been opened, they realize now that you are indeed the Lord of all the universe, not just the Lord and master of peace, which I pray you give to every one of us in here right now by your grace and mercy as we turn our eyes.